Jesus touched me and now I am no longer the same when he touched me oh he touched me and oh That floods my soul Something happened And now I know He touched me And made me whole Good morning Welcome to Coaching You in the Word. The next 30 minutes could be the most precious 30 minutes of your Sunday as you will be coached through the Word of God concerning how to develop and enrich your life as you grow in the knowledge and revelation of Him. You don't want to miss a second of the teaching as your spiritual life depends on your ability to know the Word of God. This is your day for renewal and refreshing as I coach you in the Word. Hi, I'm Mike Springston, and I'll be your speaker for the next 30 minutes. I'm the pastor at Family Fellowship Chapel in Mount Airy, North Carolina. It's my pleasure to invite you to attend our Sunday morning service this morning at 10.30 a.m. Family Fellowship Chapel is located at 2237 South McKinney Road in Mount Airy, North Carolina. Today at FFC, you will find that we offer an adult mixed Sunday school seminar at 9.30 a.m. Our children's church begins at 11 a.m. and our Wednesday evening service begins at 7 p.m. We would enjoy you and your family coming and being a part of our church. We have no visitors at FFC, only people from the family of God worshiping His goodness and praising His name. If you're coming down the interstate, we're located right across from the Mount Airy Campground, Mayberry Campground entrance. Prepare your heart, if you will, to hear the Word of God today by praying with me. Father, as we begin today, please allow us to forget ourselves. Please allow us to forget our struggles and please allow us to forget our trials. I ask you today, Father, that we might focus on only you. Allow us to see you as much bigger, much greater, much stronger than the storms of life, as bigger than any problem we face. As we see your magnificence and your majesty, please allow our spirit man to be released so that we can worship you, so that we can worship you as God, as creator, And then is the God who is my personal resource. As we surrender to you this very moment, I give myself and we give ourselves to the teaching of the Word of God. Open our eyes that we may see and our ears that we may hear what the Word of God is saying. Then, Lord, teach us how to apply these truths to our lives. Holy Spirit, we surrender to your instruction and your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, everybody. I hope you enjoyed Waymaker by the FFC Praise Team on this May the 10th, 2020. I hope you're doing well. I hope God is visiting with you in your homes. And if you're able to be on the job, that you are sensing the presence and the blessed power of God as you do. I want to invite you this morning to join us at 1030 on Family Fellowship Chapel's Facebook page will be giving our Sunday morning service, and I know that you don't want to miss it. Uh, I believe this week we're talking about uh, the workmanship of God, part two from Ephesians chapter two and verse 10. I pray that uh, you'll tune in and enjoy the worship, the praise, and enjoy the ministry of God's word. So today we're going to talk about the way of the transgressor. And it comes from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. And it reads like this, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. America's beloved Billy Graham said uh, something in one of his sermons that caught my attention. He said that sin is universal and must have a universal remedy. He preached that. All people are born into sin, which makes every person equally a sinner, and therefore we are in need of repentance 
and to start a new life in Christ. He was unrelenting and uncompromising in his message. As I watched, I saw people come in droves in his crusades to accept by faith the work of redemption that has been brought to them through the cross. It was amazing. His voice is silenced today, but he still speaks from the grave. Paul in the book of Romans gives us a summary of sin and its nature and how it's, it's manifest and manifestations of sin. According to the Hebrew and Greek words rendered as sin, the word has within it seven elements. They are transgression, iniquity, error, missing the mark, trespass, lawlessness, and unbelief. Perhaps it would help us if we took time to think about the meanings of these seven words because they are deadly in their influence over our lives. You see, I never in my faintest imagination thought of myself as involved in any of these. They were not a part of anything to do with me, or so I thought. But God saw it differently. I was born into them with the ability to commit any one of them at any time and at their convenience. Absolutely no one has to teach a child how to lie, be selfish, be rebellious, or for that matter, any other bad habit. Sin is innate, and it will manifest itself. This is why Jesus instructed that we must be born again and why repentance must be preached and why this gospel must go out. So let's be clear in our understanding of what these seven elements of sin mean. Let's begin where Isaiah began with transgression. It is in simple terms the breaking of the barrier between good and evil, iniquity and its in-depth wickedness. Error is departure from right. Missing the mark is failure to meet divine standards. Lawlessness is not obeying authority or the law and being unruly. Trespass is the intrusion of self-will into the divine authority. And unbelief is an insult to divine truth. Of the seven of these, only one can be inherited iniquity. It can be passed down to the third and fourth generation according to Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 9. So Jesus was wounded for our transgressions, David said in Psalms 119. These words, keep back thy servant also from the presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. One very good example of transgression, which is breaking the barrier between good and evil, is that of David when he took another man's wife, Bathsheba by name. Her husband was killed over it, and David paid a very great price for it in the death of the son that was born out of his sin. He was also reprimanded by Nathan the prophet, which was a stinging blow. The grief and sorrow that came out of that episode were tremendous, and they always are. But Jesus also bore this upon himself at the cross, so there is grace and forgiveness for the offender who repents. Proverbs 13, 15 is the contrast between righteousness and wickedness. The writer says that good understanding gives favor, but the way of the transgressor is hard. Breaking the barrier between good and evil brings disaster. Homes are broken up because of it. People are killed because of it. Children are damaged for life because of it. It is costly and it is deadly, yet it happens every single day. Look at the man in prison or the man on death row. How did he get there? He transgressed the law, lost his freedom, and finds out the hard way what hardship really is. All transgressions are not that severe, but they all carry a price tag. 
But then look at the cost of breaking the power of this sin alone. Jesus was wounded and bled on the cross from the top of his innocent head to his sinless feet. He never walked in the way of it, but it was a part of what brought his death. I can't stress enough the power of this sin that held men in its grip. We read about it in Isaiah, go on about our business and never consider the pain, suffering, and the loss to Jesus Christ who took it upon himself and died from it to redeem humanity from its stronghold. Much more could be said right here, but please be reminded that it was our transgression, not his, for which he was wounded. And as bad as the result of it is, it can be forgiven because and only because Jesus paid the price for it in the fall. So be aware fully that the consequences of it will allow your world to collapse around you and your decision will bring grief and sorrow. Unlimited and unrestricted. Everybody knows somebody if not himself or herself, who has committed this sin and carried its baggage for the rest of their lives, having never asked forgiveness, which is fully available because of the wounds put upon the Redeemer. Isaiah wrote, Come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, you can be made as white as snow. That's a miracle in and of itself. Oh, what a Savior! Then Isaiah said, Jesus was bruised for our iniquities. Bruising causes pain as well as wounds do. But the blood doesn't show up outside the body. The blood comes to the surface and leaves huge spots in many cases. So from his bruising to pay for iniquity, we learn that the wickedness in it is internal and deep. It can be inherited. It is brutal to deal with. It shows up in many ways. It is a force of uncontrollable proportion. And the longer it remains, the more it manifests. But there is a remedy. Jesus paid for it in full. There is forgiveness for those who come to Christ. Also, Jesus was given the tremendous task of correcting us so that we could have peace. Peace is a product of the work of Calvary and his behavior on the way there. As we read the story in the Word and get the picture of what took place before and on and after the cross, we see Jesus quietly doing what he came to do. He was totally quiet when he could have defended himself. He was calm when he could have gone into a full-blown rage. And he didn't give up and walk away when they were doing their worst. He was at peace and had a forgiving attitude. When he was resurrected from the dead, he came into the presence of men speaking peace to them. When he was <coughs> excuse me, ready to leave this world, take his flight heavenward, he left with a message of peace. He said, and I quote, I came forth from my father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the father. These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We can not only have peace and be afraid uh, uh, of everything that comes down the pike. Neither can we have peace and be enraged, be a creator of problems and of trouble, and be, to put it plainly, in a constant state of being hard to get along with. Those things are destroyers of our peace. Beyond these things, he was beaten until the flesh of his back was in shreds for your healing and mine. Nothing 
was left to chance at Calvary. Jesus took care of the whole person. It's all there, and we can have it free of charge just for the asking and believing. Above all, Isaiah began this prophecy with transgression. Therefore, it seems that this is a good place to start. If we can't get rid of this, we are certainly not going to be able to find it easy to get the rest of what Jesus died for. Isaiah said that he was marred more than any other man. This is to say that he was unrecognizable after what he went through at the hands of man. Then he said something like, no one is going to believe what I am about to say. God has done all his that he is ever going to do concerning these matters. In fact, Calvary took care of it, took care of every bit of it. And God did it not through just anybody, but through his own son. But it still remains that the way of the transgressor is hard. The iniquity is still inherited. And there is no peace and healing is still out there. Unless we act on it and act by faith and receive it, that's where it will remain. It will just remain available and out there. Yes, the way of the transgressor is hard. When we break the barrier between good and evil, the break can never be repaired, but it can be forgiven. The guilt of transgression is tremendous. We see this in Adam and Eve in the garden. What they did in their transgression caused them to try to cover it up. This is the way of, the, of, of this sin. Once committed, it causes other sins, covering it up, lying about it, and then resisting the blame are all typical responses by anyone and everyone for these seven sins. Another one of these sins is iniquity. This is the only sin that can be inherited uh, from as far down the bloodline as great, great, grandfathers as mentioned before in this teaching the law against this sin was established in deuteronomy 5 9 it reads thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them and that's referring to having any other gods nor serve them for i the lord thy god am a jealous god visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me Let's throw in verse 10 that says, and showing mercy unto them that love me and keep my commandments. So here we are told that mercy is shown to those that love God enough to keep his commandments as opposed to those that hate him and are willing to break his commandments. Right here we need to understand that the commandments were not established because God wanted to restrict our behavior for his benefit. They were given to protect human beings from, for their own sake, from themselves. God sees iniquity as in-depth, deep within humanity. Jesus was not only wounded for our transgression, but was bruised for our iniquities also. Now we know that sin in all forms is sin. But we need to understand that it is from transgression and iniquity that all other sins derive. This is the reason that only these two are mentioned by Isaiah. Missing the mark or failure to meet the divine standards of God has a root cause. Every error is a departure from right. There's no question about that. According to... To Psalms 51, 9 and 10, this has to come from an uncleansed heart. Romans 3, 23 reads like this. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Trespass also has a root cause. It is the intrusion of self-will into the sphere of divine authority. 
Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, that we have been quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the princes of this world, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. So it is the satanic spirit that brings about trespass. And from this we were made alive in the spirit when we received Jesus Christ. Lawlessness is spiritual anarchy. According to 1 Timothy 1 9, Paul wrote, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for the sinners, for the unholy and profane, for the murderer of mothers, for manslayers. Then he goes on in verse 10 to name many more lawless things and ends the verse with this. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to divine doctrine or sound doctrine, unbelief is one of the seven. It is an insult to the divine truth, honesty, and accuracy. Unbelief, according to Jesus in John sixteen eight and 9, brings us under the judgment of God. He said in talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit, when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin. Of sin because they believe not on me. All we have to do to be lost is not to believe what Jesus has done to redeem us. Sin originated in Satan, entered into the world through Adam, and is universal and incurs the penalties of sin. And physical death. So it has no remedy but in the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, available only by faith. Sin is a violation of the revealed will of God. It is absent of righteousness and is an enemy of God. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ to break the chain of anyone or all of these seven elements of sin. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ to break the chains of anyone over everyone of these seven elements of sin. But we can be set free just by the asking. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. It paid the price in full. My friend, if you don't know Jesus today, I want you to know him. Pray this prayer. Father, forgive me my sins. I accept you today as my personal Savior. I give you my life, my internal self, and I turn my life over to you today. And I believe because I have prayed this prayer that I am saved in Jesus' name. And there is no doubt you are. Today is a new day for you, a new moment, a new opportunity. I pray that you will be blessed. Now, I want you to contact me at springston56 at gmail.com. I want you to have a great week. Join me at 1030 on Family Fellowship Chapel's Facebook page, and let's worship together. Hey, Jesus is Lord, and don't you forget it. God bless you. Until we meet next week at 9.15 on Coaching You in the Word.